Today, we're going to do something a little different. Normally, for communion, we do Psalms 22. But I've chosen some scriptures that Christ, re- he, he spoke of them on the cross, some of them. So open your Bibles, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. And Hebrews chapter 2, we're going to pick it up with verse 9, concerning our Savior. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. That includes you. He did this because he was perfect. And his motive, we'll find out in a moment, why he would do this, and why he would do it for you and any whomsoever would believe. And for it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. He did that suffering and he didn't whimper. He did it for you. You might say, why? Why? Because he loves you. Our Father loves you very much. And he did not complain to pay the ultimate price to accomplish a goal. We'll find out what that is in a moment, as well as many other things. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, one family, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. You know, there he is, Emmanuel, God with us. And being, he doesn't mind calling you a brother or a sister. Why? Again, it's real simple. Because he loves you. Verse 12, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren, In the midst of the church, the congregation, will I sing praise unto thee. That's a quote from Psalms 22, 22. That's his words upon the cross as he paid the ultimate price. And he stated that. He said, I want this to be taught in the whole congregation so they won't forget, so they will remember. Verse 13, and again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the the children which God hath given me. Here comes the reason, don't ever forget it. 14, for as much then as the children are partakers of the flesh and blood, he also, Emmanuel, God with us, he also himself likewise took part of the same. But that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. He did this so he could destroy the devil, get him off of all of our backs, give him a run to see how many of you are going to follow him. I know none of you are. And uh, you're going to stand against him. But he did this. You see, because it would be Satan's own Kenites that would be in that congregation at the trial saying, crucify him. And so in turn, they signed their own warrant for Satan himself because he will be blotted out. He will be destroyed. And uh, our father has no problem in doing that because he tried to destroy God, Emmanuel, God with us. So if anyone ever asks you, why would Christ pay that price on the cross? That's your answer. So we could destroy death, which is to say the devil, and do it 
fairly, honestly. He's got it coming to him. Let him have it. Verse 15, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. To, to bondage. Sin can put you in bondage, okay? For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. In other words, he asked you to be born in the flesh, which, you know, flesh can be painful. Live, living in these flesh bodies, you're exposed to many things. But uh, so when he could have come as an angel, he could have come as himself, but he chose rather to show you his love for you. He came in the flesh also to show you how to get it done. Verse 17, wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people, not his sins. He didn't have any. He did this for your sins so that on repentance, they could be erased. And in the book of life, your very name is clear. Mark paid in full. Don't ever forget who paid it for you. He did. And he did it on that cross. Verse 18, for in that he himself has suffered being Tempted, he is able to secure them that be tempted. In other words, that secure is a legal term, meaning he's going to guarantee it. All you have to do is believe. You know, uh, when you take a creator of all things, and then he created children for his pleasure, documentation, Revelation chapter 4, the last verse. He created all things for his pleasure. Because he loves his children, he saw fit, even though he was the creator, to come in the same body as you're in, a flesh body, and paid that price, showing us how to get it done. That should encourage you in these end times. To know if he loved you that much, there is no way that any entity is going to draw you away from the word of God. That word that sustains you. That word that lifts you. That word that secures your eternal lifetime. Whereby, what, what a beautiful place this earth is when it's cleansed. When when it goes back into the proper uh, pole that it's supposed to, now that it's 90 degrees off, 90 miles off, to do away with things that offend. And at one time, buttercups grew in, Ala in Alaska under the tundra because it was beautiful up there. Why? Because the earth hadn't fallen yet. Satan hadn't fallen. You can look forward to that. He secured it for you with his blood. Turn on to chapter 10 of this same book. Hebrews chapter 10. Let's pick it up with verse 4. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. That, it just doesn't get it done. Where a priest or, uh, took the sacrifice. Yeah, it cost people a little money for taking the prize out of their herd and, and donating it. But the love wasn't there that Christ had when he accomplished that sacrifice. Five. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. And so it was that he, he saw fit 
to come in, born to woman, flesh body, seed of Abraham, to pay this price for you. Verse 6, and burn offerings and sacrifices for sin that has, thou hast no pleasure. And as God says in the Minor Prophets in Hosea 6, 6, I don't want your burnt offerings. I want your love. That's what he wants from you. That's what sacrificial loving will be in the millennium, is your love for him, whereby he is, is, is um, honored and glorified as our Father. Then said I, Christ speaking, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. And so it is that even in Genesis chapter 1, where the word and, which is a polysendent, and which means much more is meant than is written, was the Holy Spirit moving upon all things. And then in chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, where he talked about the Kenite themselves, the offspring of the serpent, that one, he would bruise the heels of Christ. He'd nail them to the cross. But in turn, Christ would bruise his head. He is, he's going to get his gourd smashed. And Christ is doing that. Why? Because he loves you. It would seem that most people really, you know, that one fact, they have trouble knowing. He's got time for you. He loves you. You've heard me say that your DNA is different. Your fingerprints are different. There's nobody else like you. Why did he create somebody unique like yourself? Because he loves you because he wants you to return that love, to love him. That's why he didn't even consider paying that awesome price on the cross, that you could have that love freely and secure your eternal life because he loves you. He comes in the volume of the book from beginning to end, eight, Above, when he said, sacrifice and offering and burn offerings, uh, an offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Verse 9, then said he, lo, I come <clears throat> to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. He took away the old law of blood ritual. Didn't not, now understand he didn't destroy the law. He destroyed blood rituals. There's a difference. Verse 10, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. It doesn't have to be done every year in the Holy of Holies. But that one time, Christ's body was sufficient that it paid the price forever. And in so doing, the same altar that the sacrifice was offered upon, he rent that veil from top to bottom and said, you come on in. You don't have to be a high priest. He said, you're one of my children. I love you. You come on in. You talk to me. You don't need some preacher or some priest or somebody else in front of you to speak for you. You talk to me. You hear my love for you, he says, and come in, be at home. It's paid for. It was paid for by his blood. Verse 11, and every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. They can't. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down at the right hand of God, right on the throne. Verse 13, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. I don't have to tell you who's gonna put that enemy under his footstool. 
It's God's elect with the Holy Spirit speaking through them. 14, for by one offering, he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. Not, not just for a little while. It's not just a passing thing, but forever. It's secured. It's guaranteed. In conclusion, let's turn to Isaiah 53. Isaiah chapter 53 <clears throat> tells of his experience at the cross and kind of what was going through his mind and what should be going through yours. And let's pick it up with Isaiah 53 verse 1. Who hath believed our report? Not too many do. And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? whereby it's opened and you can see the strength and the power of that arm of God that caresses you. Verse 2, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of the dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Many people confuse or get confused with this verse because they don't understand the Hebrew of the word form and comeliness. Form means he has no appearance of pride. You understand that? He has no appearance of pride, the pride that took Satan down. Christ was a very humble being. And he never showed pride. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty. Why, he's got it all. If nothing else, what he did for us makes him beautiful, regardless of what his appearance would be. That he died for you. That your sins could be washed away. Verse 3. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. They all ran, all but a few women over on a hill here. They ran. Not going to happen again. When we have to make that stand before the false one, we're going to stand. Because he is with us. He has guaranteed it. You have nothing to fear but fear itself. And you, you can just erase it. We will never abandon him. And he will never ever abandon you. I will never leave thee. I will never forsake thee. That is his word. But boy did they forsake him that night. Verse 4, surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet he did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. It, it, it wasn't easy, but he did it through love so that you could have that forgiveness. When you mess up and when you have shortcomings, you tell him how much you love him, ask his forgiveness. It's erased. He guarantees it. Verse 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions, not his. He was bruised for our iniquities, not his. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. And so it, he took the punishment. But when you pray to him for a touch, that's what Holy Communion is. It's an anointing of the very soul of taking Christ into yourself and you and him, that you receive healings and blessings. And even in proxy, you can do it for other people that you may think would never even have a thought, and yet, bang, God can change minds and hearts. 
It's nothing to him. Love is a beautiful thing. He received the stripes. We get the healing. All we like sheep have gone astray and we've turned every one to his own way and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Again, it's disgraceful that it happened. Really it is. But we're not going to let that happen again, beloved. You can swear it to yourself all day long. It's not going to happen again. We're not going to forsake him. Though governments may say, take God's name out of it, guess what? That government will vote out of office. We will not run. We will stand firm. And we will declare his name, his precious name, unashamedly. Verse 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Even Pilate said to him, hey, don't you realize they want to kill you? And I know you, Pilate knew he was innocent. He said, talk to me. Tell me, I have the power to either let them do it or take it away. Talk to me. But it was time in God's plan for the price to be paid. And he was paying it. He would not open his mouth. He did not whimper. He did not say, let's put this off. He did it for you. Do I have to say why again? Because he loves you. You know, there, I know he doesn't love some of the things we do sometimes. But boy, does he love you. And on repentance, it's so easy. With the price having been paid to erase that slate clean where you have a new start in life. With his blessings. And, and so it is. He did not open his mouth. Verse 8, he was taken from prison and from judgment. And <clears throat> who, who shall declare his generation? We will. It's the generation of the fig tree. <clears throat> for he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgressions of my people was he stricken. Verse 9, and he made his grave with the wicked. Two malefactors hanging on each side of him. Do you think that bothered him? No, he converted one of them. One of them because of his humble actions believed upon him. And Christ told him in one place, this day I will see thee in paradise. And so he did. That's how easy it is, even as Christ was paying the price with his blood on the cross, he forgave that one. He will also forgive you and with the rich in death because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. He was buried in a rich man's tomb because he, he had no sin. And that rich man, of course, was Mary's uncle, Joseph of Arimathea, the tin man, which Christ spent in his younger years many according to history, a, a lot of days with him, with um, Joseph of Arimathea. This is, it is history, and how precious it is. Uh, verse 10, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for his sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge, this is important, by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. That is the knowledge you want to search for. That is the knowledge, the knowledge of Christ. 
What again was his name? The Word of God. And from that Word, you want to bring that knowledge in that guarantees you eternal life. Not, not a pit, not a fire, and not being blotted out, but having a wonderful spiritual body that never knows any pain or boredom for an eternity. Yours for the asking and yours for the repenting. Verse 12, therefore will I divide him a portion with the great and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he has poured out his soul unto death and he was numbered with the transgressors and he bare the sin of many. That's yours too and made intercession for the transgressors. He made intercession for you. That intercession, that means he took your place. He didn't open his mouth, he didn't whimper. And how precious it is. What greater love could man have than to lay his life down for his family? And so it is that he accomplished that. He paid that price on the cross. And he paid it willingly. Why? As an intercessor for you. Heavenly Father, thank you, Father, for this day. Thank you, Father, for your salvation. Thank you, Father, for the, the right to repent, Father, of sins and to be blessed. And we as a congregation at this time, as we're about to partake of the Lord's table, do all repent and ask your wonderful forgiveness as we partake of this precious communion, Father. We ask it in Yeshua's precious name. Amen, amen. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Okay, question time. We're going to go with... Uh, Nikki from Massachusetts. My husband passed away three years ago and I have been praying to God that he would come see me and I know, he, so I know that he is all right. Will God answer my prayer? He, he already has. He's already answered it. All you have to do is read Luke 16 and the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Your husband's not in some hole in the ground. He is with the Father. And the reason I say your answer is there is old Lazarus was taken right into the arms of Abraham. They were happy to see him. And he was on the right side of paradise, the right side of the gulf, which is explained there in that 16th chapter. God will never leave you nor forsake you. So I, I can, you can rest assured if, if your husband earned it, he is in real good shape. He's okay. Uh, Betty from Florida, could you please explain Revelation 13, 5? I would sure appreciate it. Thank you. Well, the dragon in verse 4 has just healed the one world system, political system. And, and in verse 5, it says he's going to have 42 months. The dragon is Satan. 
all prophecies given concerning Satan are given in months, which are what? Moons, darkness of the night. All the prophecies given concerning God's children, example two witnesses, is days, 1,260. Days, light, sun. So uh, that lets you know that it is Satan and that he's healed the world political system and he's going to set up his office as Jesus Christ. Only he is Antichrist. Anti in the Greek tongue means instead of. He's coming instead of Christ at the sixth trump. Now a child can count from one to seven. And you are told in the book of Revelation, Christ is not going to return until the seventh trump. So, so you can count on it. But the Antichrist comes at the sixth trump. That's what that 13th chapter. If you were to continue on into about the 11th verse, th then it lets you know that he, he looks like the Lamb of God. I mean, he's, he's got power even. But his voice is the voice of the dragon, and he performs miracles in the sight of people to convince them that he's the man. Uh, if you're not familiar with our Father's word to be prepared for that, to serve God, you could be deceived and buy a bill of goods that would be one of the biggest mistakes you could ever make in your life, is to be a Satan worshiper even if you did it in ignorance. Estelle from North Carolina. Will there be flesh people in the millennium? No, absolutely not. You, you, where you find your answer to that is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse uh, 50. Well, let's take 50. Flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom of heaven, and the kingdom will be here. And in that instant, in that wink of an eye, we're all changed into our spiritual bodies. No flesh in the millennium. Uh, Ron from Kentucky. I just want to say that the reason Jesus cried out from the cross was because Jesus was in the flesh. I heard you answer this question. Then you didn't listen, did you? You didn't listen at all. He did not cry out because he was in the flesh. He was the Word of God. And when he cried out, what was the words again? Eli, Eli, lama shabbatane. Which is to say what? Psalms 22, verse 1. He was quoting a scripture. Because that scripture tells about the whole, what the false priests are doing, how they're nailing him to the cross, it was written a thousand years before the fact. And you think he cried out because he was in the flesh? He cried out because he was teaching you that that crucifixion took place and it was written of God in Psalms 22 a thousand years before the fact. That's why you can always believe God's word. You see, the 22nd verse of that speaks the Roman soldiers gambling for his clothing? In Psalms 22? Yes, fine. God wrote it. God knew. That's what he was talking. He was teaching you that he was simply quoting the scripture and you should understand the scripture. Uh, Michelle from, Michael rather, from Pennsylvania. And thank you for your comments. My question is at the time of death as a Christian, is it absent from the body is present with the Lord? Yeah, you're quoting scripture. That's uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 and 8. Is there a wait until he returns? Or are we reunited with loved ones? Where in the Bible does it tell us? It tells you in the millennium chapters of the great book of Ezekiel. From chapter 40 to the end of Ezekiel is all about the millennium. There's more about the millennium in the Old Testament than there is the New. And in the 45th chapter, verse 20, if you are one of God's elect, if you love Him, then if you have parents that are on the 
that di did not make it to the right side of paradise, you can go help them. How would you help them? Get your act together. This is final. Um, Pennsylvania. I am listening to the Apocalypse of Isaiah. That would be Isaiah 24, I believe. In Revelation 9, when you go into the three woes, when the smoke rises up out of the sun, now let me, let me correct you if I may, and I'm not talking down to you, but the smoke doesn't come from the sun. The smoke comes from the pit, and it rises up and darkens the sun, okay? Is that the beginning of the first age of the locust, stage of the locust? And at the end of the locust, is that the beginning of the sixth trump? Uh, and there, you've got it pretty well. We're, we're knocking on that door right now. It's an exciting time. Uh, Liz from California. Uh, where will we be placed during the 10-day trial when the Antichrist comes? Will Will, when we are brought up uh, to testify, will we be put? Will we be put in jail? No, he's he's coming for a revival. Okay, you got to think of it in that term. He's going to pull a huge revival, claiming that he is Messiah, and he's trying to convert people. You cannot convert people if you throw them in jail or abuse them. He rather is going to woo them. Now, the ten, the ten days she's talking about are, uh, as you will find in, in Revelation chapter 2, verse 9 and 10, on the church of Smyrna. And it says that is an individual thing. Overall, there will be five months, but no individual will have to worry about witnessing for over a ten-day period. And then somebody else will take over. Kathy from Minnesota. Pastor, I do not have much. My son is trying to learn, and there is so much evil in this world. Please give me scripture that I can hold on to to overcome any problems. I love your teaching, and thank you for all you've done. Well, you're very welcome. The Word of God is powerful. And you keep educating your son in God's Word, and the scripture I would give you is one I give most everybody to overcome this world. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. And what it says there is God will never, if you love him, he will never tempt you over what you can, or let you be tested for over what you can handle. You can cut it, okay? And, and um, he, he will always, always show you a way through. So you're, you, that's, that's faith to know. I don't care what kind of trouble comes up. You're going to make it through. Okay. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Howard from California. I've heard it many times that Satan is looking for the bones of Moses. Where can I find this in the scripture? In one little very short book. It's called the book of Jude. And you will find it in the ninth verse of the book of Jude, where there's a good lesson there. It says, don't ever argue with Satan. You know, you tell him to get behind you or to get away from you. And, and don't try to argue with him. Why? He is sharp. He can quote more scripture as he documented in Matthew 4, testing Christ, tempting Christ, rather attempting to tempt Christ, then most Christians can quote. So he's very impressive. And, and certainly uh, it lets you know there in that same book that you don't argue with him. And then in just following that, you'll find out that, uh, that um, Enoch, one of the reasons he was taken is because of the fallen angels and he was preaching against it. Uh, he, 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 uh, he was a preacher. Okay, this is Margie from North Carolina. My question, I want to know were all, all or part of the prophets in the first world age? God bless all of you. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. 
not only all of the prophets, all of us. God created all souls in the first earth age. And every, we were all there. And this is why that God would write in, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, I chose you before the foundations of this earth age. Why? Because of something you did there. Probably stood against Satan. You didn't need Enoch in this earth age to teach you. You found him to be an abomination even then. And that's why God's elect, that he, he, they overcame there, basically. Doesn't mean they can't sin here. They can. And he always corrects them big time. But uh, what it is, God can interfere in their lives to the point of making Scripture come to pass as it's written without having them on Judgment Day say, why did you do that to me? Because they've already overcome. God will not interfere in someone's life by force that has free will to change anything about their life so that on Judgment Day they can't say, you're the one that did it. Now, if they ask him prayerfully, and it is their asking, then God might change something for that one that has free will, okay? Uh, Pastor, this is Gino from Arkansas. Um, I believe the Facebook student site has been taken down after hearing your answers to numerous questions that you are not in approval of the Facebook or YouTube. No, because they claim to be me. And, and they're not giving answers I would give in many cases. I do, I do, I st do still see folks still sharing your website link on Facebook, nothing more. Is it permissible to share the Shepherd's Chapel website with folks on Facebook? It's a crime. How can I tell you it's all right when it's criminal? And um, we have one or two that are giving a little trouble, and we're probably going to have to sue them. You, you mean sue a Christian? They're not Christian. They're thieves. Okay. We, have to, we have to take care of business. God expects discipline, and God expects us to take care of discipline. It is a crime to reproduce copyrighted material in, in any form or way and make it public. So you don't want to be a criminal. We have, everything is free on television and we have our own website, it's there free. You, you don't need to go playing with a bunch of thieves, okay? Harry from Florida, if God loves us so much, why would he send us to hell? <coughs> well, <coughs> what makes you think that God loves somebody so much he's going to send to hell. Okay. Let, let's take, um, you think God doesn't have emotions? Um, Malachi chapter 1, Jacob by love Esau, I hate it because of what he did in the first earth age. You see, our father cares about his children. He cares about the children until he practiced discipline. In other words, by the end of the millennium, which is when the great white throne judgment takes place, anyone that is sentenced to hell there, which means the second death, the death of the soul, then they have had every opportunity. Why? Because they will be in spiritual bodies in the millennium. And there, there will be teaching in that thousand year period. It's called the Lord's Day. And Anyone that refuses the open door, which is to say Christ, the Savior, God's going to protect his children because we're going to be there for an eternity and we don't want a bunch of, of um, malefactors there. It's time to do away with them. It's his love for his children that causes him to send someone to hell that deserves it. Bill from Missouri, Do the, did the daughters of Adam know they were being seduced by the fallen angels? Well, they were pretty impressive. 
And they must have because it is written in Genesis chapter 6 that only Noah's family had a perfect, uh, the, the word is generation, but it means pedigree in the Hebrew tongue. The, the, all other, uh, neither he nor his wife, nor his sons nor their wives had intermixed with the fallen angels, whereby there were Geber, meaning giants, uh, present there at that time. So it was on a pretty mass scale. Pastor Mary, please tell me what this means. Thanks, and it is the fish with the letters which cipher. Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. It's, it's what uh, identifies a Christian church in dangerous areas in times past. It's, it's uh, because the word fish uh, in the Greek um, is Son of God, uh, Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. Lor Lenora from Michigan. Is it okay to anoint yourself to help someone else if that person doesn't know that you are doing it for them? Of course it does. That's called intercessor, intercession. intercession. Intercession prayer uh, or anointing or whatever the case may be uh, is perfectly all right. God honors that. So you, you feel free to do it. Betty from Nebraska, Pastor, please tell me how I can help my 12-year-old grandson study the Bible. He is asking me questions. Well, Betty, answer them as best you can. And, you know, don't ever, uh, you know, I answer many questions and in front of live audiences and everywhere. And some, some preachers will say, well, how, why do you do that? Or, you know, because I don't mind saying I don't know something. And don't you mind saying, I don't know, but let's find out. And you take your Strong's Concordance and get in there and teach him how to dig it out. And, but uh, you, you are blessed that he's asking you questions because that is, I mean, that is God saying, plant a seed. Plant a seed. So you're blessed. Um, Carl from Ohio, my, wi my wife and I donate to organizations such as, number one, children with cancer, two, homeless, hungry people, three, Animals League, and they all believe in Easter. Shall, should we still support these organizations? Well, everybody must feel led to do what they feel is right, and no one can advise you on that. Uh, I, I would make one recommendation, that you read the second epistle of John. What does the second epistle of John say? It says, if you even as much as wish God speed to a false teacher, you are becoming a part of it. Now. If you have no conviction and you still feel it's right, you continue on doing what, what uh, you, because God leads us to do what he would have us do. Uh, Randy from Oklahoma, I want to thank you for teaching God's word so I can understand. He gave you a great gift. Well, thank you, I appreciate that. I can, I can read, but I don't understand, and when you teach, I can understand. I have a question I have asked before, but I guess it did, you didn't find it. The question is, if I die before Satan comes, well, I still know him in my spirit body. I know he won't trick me in my flesh body. Thank you. Well, he won't trick you in your spiritual body either because you'll be in a different place than he is, number one. You'll be on the, the right side of the gulf in, in paradise. He's not there. But uh, there's nothing wrong with, with the, uh, it's called those that have the truth and pass on before, it's called the remnant. There has always been a remnant of God's elect that bring forth the real word of God gifted 
and deliver it whereby people have an opportunity to hear truth and uh, not fiction and and it's God's blessings but they're called the remnant and there's nothing wrong with that and at the same time God is putting together an army in heaven that's going to come here with him and that's why we won't be fighting in Armageddon and Haman Gog. God and the angels will because God wants the um, atheist and the nations that would come against to know he's real. God is real. And when, when he takes them out, that will be their lesson to know. And then, of course, comes the millennium and they will see him. Christ, that is to say. Alita from California. I also want to know where in the Bible it's mentioned that Cain is the son of the devil. I hope this letter I hope this letter makes it on the question and answer. Well, it, congratulations it did. Probably there is many places, but probably the best place is St. John, the book we just completed, uh, chapter 8 verse 44 where he said you claim to be of our brother Judah, but you know you you um, uh, do things he didn't. You are of your father, the first murderer. Now, who was the first murderer? Well, it was Cain, of course. And the deeds of your father you will do. You are the children of the devil. And you can also read and. In uh, Matthew chapter 13, for a second witness, begin reading with 35, and it'll take you down through 42, where he will tell you Satan's the one that planted the wicked seed, the Kenites. Okay, Sandy from West Virginia. I want to know if I still have a chance for, uh, for, for forgiveness and well of course you do I see that you've had quite a life but what did what did Christ tell the disciples if if you repent 490 times seven times 70 that's how God said if they truly repent you forgive them and certainly that's the way he is he loves to forgive somebody that's honest. And, and in the flesh, God doesn't wake up every morning and say, wonder who I can zap today. He loves his children. He leads them. He directs them. He feeds them with the food, the manna, which is the word of God from heaven. And um, I, I don't care how many times you feel you backslid. When you come to him with a loving heart and you are really repentant, don't ever try to con him because he knows what you're thinking. He will forgive you. So it's never too late, okay? Not, not, in, not in this earth age. In the millennium, it could be too late. Gene from California. Are demons and fallen angels the same thing? No, 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 no. Demons are evil spirits. That, that's the way it's written in the manuscripts, the, that they are evil spirits. And they are, they are the opposite of the Holy Spirit. For every negative, there is a positive. And for every positive, there is a negative. But the fallen angels are... According to Revelation 11, there's only 7,000 of them. They're seeing, it seems like that little book of Jude's coming up quite a bit today, doesn't it? But in the first six verses of that great book of Jude, a little short book right before Revelation, it states that their sin is they left their place of habitation and came to earth as angel beings, which Adam is made in their perfect image, meaning they were male, and they seduced the daughters of Adam. Um, Mark from South Carolina, but uh, evil spirits are, it can even be Satan, it's 
evil spirit, okay? Mark from South Carolina, thank God for your fellowship and leadership. I have a question about swearing. If you have to go to court and they ask you to put your hand on the Bible and swear, is that wrong? I think it is, but it's unclear to me. Thank you. And you're just, if I were not going to tell the truth, then I might give that a lot of thought. But if you're going to swear the, to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, then, then that's good. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, God will bless you for it. So the Word of God is not something we have to be afraid of. You want to hold it near and dear. It's precious. Uh, Stacy from New York. Where in the Bible can I read about how many sacred names of God there is? Well, there, there's really only one. There's many used, Adonai and um, El, and, um, but his real name is, what did he say to Moses? Moses said, who am I going to say sent me? And he said, tell them, Yah sent you. So, Yahweh is the sacred name, Yahweh. And, um, that is really the only one, the true sacred name. I'm out of time. Hey, I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Most of all, God loves it. Do you understand it's the letter He sent to you and it makes His day when you study that letter to be pleasing to Him. And when you make His day, boy, is He going to make yours. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Won't you do that? You bless God, He will always bless you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Most important, listen to me. Listen good. You stay in His Word. Every day in His Word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas. 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you.